fear. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. <laughs> Through faith also, Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed, and was delivered of a child when she was past age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on earth. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. By faith, Jacob, when he was a dying blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning upon the top of his staff. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians assigned to do were drowned. By faith the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not, when she had received the spies with peace.
who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, Women received their dead raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather in, be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. And make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. And the sound of a trumpet, and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them any more. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn which are written in heaven 
and to God the judge of all and to the spirits of just men made perfect see that ye refuse not him that speaketh for if they escaped not who refused him that spake on earth how much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven and this word yet once more signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made that those things which cannot be shaken remain for our God everyone together for our God is a consuming fire uh, Brother John, would you open us in a word of prayer? Amen. Please be seated. So there was an Olympic gold medalist, Daryl Pace, who is an archer, you know, shoots arrows with a bow. And he was set to give an exhibition at New York City Central Park. And uh, the event received coverage by all the, the various news stations. Uh, he was shooting these steel tipped, very sharp, steel-tipped hunting arrows. And he was going to, well, at first he was shooting to hit the bullseye, okay, from a distance. But he wanted a volunteer, okay? And he, he hit this bullseye many, many times, no problem, every time in the center, okay? But he wanted a volunteer. He said, all you have to do is just hold this apple in your hand, on your head, okay? And, uh, just just sit here on this chair hold the apple on your head okay which would require quite a bit of faith right so abc correspondent one of the journalists josh howell took a bold step forward he stood there with a small apple on his head and uh pace took aim from 30 yards back okay and everyone held their breath and then boom the arrow exploded that apple and hit the target behind behind Josh Howell everyone applauded and then Josh with a big grin on his face feeling very relieved that it finally was over with until his cameraman came up and said hey, i'm sorry josh but i didn't quite get that shot can you do it again there was a problem with the camera to josh's dismay so we read a lot about faith this morning and actually well let's go back um we're gonna cover we're gonna we're going to well, well last time we uh talked about in uh, Hebrews chapter 8, 9, and 10 about the heavenly tabernacle. We saw how the heavenly tabernacle mirrors the, I'm sorry, the earthly tabernacle mirrors the heavenly tabernacle, that all of the things that were given uh, were to resemble that which is in the heavenly. We also learned last time about how Jesus obtained a better ministry at the heavenly tabernacle a better ministry than that of the, the Levitical priesthood. That he also gave a sacrifice once and for all. We also saw how when Jesus died, how the veil of the temple was rent in two. We also learned what a 
testament is. Does anyone remember? What is a testament? I'm sorry? A will, yes. It's a will. And it relates to inheritance. Okay? We learned about how Jesus' death on the cross, because it said, you know, that where there is a testament, there must needs be a, the death of the testator for that testament to be in force. We saw how that Jesus Christ's death on the cross also accomplished enforcing the New Testament, whereby we, mankind, through the New Covenant, through the, the New Testament church, we can inherit all things with Jesus Christ, okay, by means of his death on the cross. And because of this, Let's go back to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. And we're just going to read, I'm going to read to the end here, but it, it gives us a couple of things that because of this we should do. It says 23, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. What, what is the profession of our faith? What is that profession Referring to anyone. Okay, so let's go back to Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. We covered this, but it's been a couple months. So let's read all together uh, verse 1. Sorry, I've got that wrong. Wait, give me just a moment. I must have wrote down the wrong... No, that's right. Yeah, okay. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. Let's read this all together. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Okay, so... Sorry, that was not the verse I was looking for. So our, our profession, that being our faith in Christ Jesus, in the new covenant, okay? Following the covenant that he gave us, the New Testament church. The second thing we saw is in verse 24. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. So that involves interacting with each other, provoking one another to good works. Okay, and then the third thing we saw is in verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Okay, so the essence, what's important with the New Testament church is that we assemble together, that we meet together, and that we don't forsake, that we don't completely abandon the New Covenant, the New Testament church. And it, it goes on to say after that, we, we read about how, for if we sin willfully after that, we have received the knowledge of the truth. This is verse 26. There remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. So it also says later on, if we go to verse... Um, Go to verse 38. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Okay, so we can see that, you know, anyone who abandons the new covenant, they're, they're going to be displeasing. They're going to be a disappointment to Jesus Christ. Okay, but if we want to be pleasing to him, the way we can do that is within the new covenant, within the New Testament church. So now we continue on to verse, chapter 11, verses 1 through 3. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. 
Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. And we, if we look at that word uh, substance, that it's a word that we saw before in, in the first couple of chapters. It's the word hypostasis. It means a stand or a pedestal, something we can put our confidence in, a foundation Okay, so it's the, the faith is the foundation of things hoped for. And then it goes on to say the evidence, that, that's elenkos, or proof of things not seen. So we get this sense here that, that of the things that we're hoping for, well, what are we hoping for? The rewards, the promises, given to the new covenant. And faith is the essence or the foundation of those things that are hoped for. It's what we can hold on to for at the time being. We saw, it says, uh, for by it the elders obtained a good report. Well, what, what are the elders that is talking about there? That's the word uh, presbyteros. Okay, and it's, it was commonly used for the Hebrews in reference to those who were, um, those who had gone before, you know, the, the fathers, the, the people who um, they looked up to in the Old Testament, and also those in their community. So it could be referencing those within the church who were the elders, or it could also be referencing those who they looked up to in the, the Old Testament. And I'm guessing because he goes on, the author here goes on to talk about the faith of those in the Old Testament, I'm guessing he's referring to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and, and these, when he says, for by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. So none of us were there when God created the earth, but we believe that he did create the earth. And why do we believe that? Because he said it, right? Because we've read it. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. So let me ask you a question. Did Abel's sacrifice save him? Did Abel's sacrifice save him? Well, I would, I would say that he, he was probably already saved before he went and sacrificed this animal. Yeah, and yeah, he was, he was doing this to please God. He was doing this to please God. Well, where did he get the idea to sacrifice an animal? Well, I would imagine that Adam and Eve would have sat down with their kids and it told them, maybe once a year, maybe once a month, but they, I'm sure they sat down many times with their kids and told them about the, what happened in the garden. How do we know that? Because how do we have these, the, the knowledge of what happened in the garden? Because someone told someone who told someone else. So that's how we know that they must have sat down and said, kids, let me tell you something. Your mom and I, we messed up. God created this beautiful Garden of Eden. And uh, we were placed in there. And we were told we could eat of the tree of life, but we were not to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Yet, your mom and I, we, we did just that. We thought we could be as... We thought we could be equal with God. We wanted to know what is it God was keeping from us? What is this forbidden knowledge? And because of that, 
You see these beautiful animals that, that you love, these pets that you have? God had to kill two of those. He had to kill two of those, shed their blood to cover us. Now remember, they didn't eat meat at that time. They didn't eat meat, meat until after the flood. So the, the idea of killing your animal, your pet, was something that was horrendous. Maybe uh, Cain, maybe he was an animal rights activist. Maybe he was the first PETA. And he just, he thought, you know, why do we have to kill an animal to please God? Why don't we just, we'll just sacrifice some plants. That's what we eat. I'm sure God will be happy with that. But no. Because of sin, the penalty, there had to be death. And so I'm sure that Adam and Eve had told that story about how God had killed those animals, took those skins to cover their nakedness, right? To cover their nakedness. So Abel sacrificed because he already realized that he wasn't worthy. Moving on to, so, so this was a matter of, not a matter of salvation that we're talking about here. We're talking about faith after salvation. We're talking about these examples that, that are going to be given here. Are examples of faith after salvation, not faith unto salvation. Okay, that's important. Now we see with Enoch, by faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. Now that's not referring to Enoch getting saved. That's talking about Enoch. We see here that it says that he already had this testimony that he pleased God. So he was already saved, and then because of his faith, God translated him. God took him up to be with the Lord. So that was verse 5 and, and 6. We can read that. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and, he was not, and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. That word there, please, it's the word yurasteo. And this particular word was actually used in, in chapter 10. We just read in verse uh, 38, where it says, My soul shall have no pleasure in him. So we're talking about faith after salvation. We're talking about putting faith in God after salvation unto to good works, things that we can do after salvation through Christ Jesus. And if we want to please the Lord, it's through faith. Through faith after. So, of course, the Lord is pleased when we first believe and repent and put our faith on him. But the subject matter here. The subject matter in Hebrews is talking about faith unto works after salvation. Amen? Amen? And so when we're talking about in the end of chapter 10, we're talking about it's impossible without faith to please him, that if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. That's that same word. That same word, for it is... But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And that word, the rewarder, is misthapodotes. And it, it means one who pays the salary in the company, okay, in the... The Greek language, this means, this is talking about the person who pays out the salary, okay? Whether it be in the company or in the Roman government, it's the person who pays things out. 
and he, that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Okay. Moving on to verse 7. By faith, Noah, being warned of God, of things not seen, as yet moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. And that word heir there implies inheritance. It implies, it's that same word, uh, kleronomos, which we saw many other times for heir. Heir of righteousness. That is justification. That is uh, the word, the Greek word, daikaios uh, une justification or, or righteousness. In verses 8 through 10, by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out, of, out into a place which he should have after received for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs of him, with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. So we see that, again, here with, with Abraham, we're talking about his works after salvation. His walk of faith after salvation. Okay, we're not talking about faith unto salvation, but his faith after salvation. We see in verse uh, 11 and 12, Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore sprang there up, sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the sea shore innumerable. Now Sarah is an interesting example. Sarah and Abraham speaking about their about Isaac. Because if you may recall, they actually didn't at first they didn't believe that God would be able to give her a child. And so they had, you know, Abraham uh, have a child with Hagar. And God said, no, the seed will be through Sarah. And then Isaac was born, right? So it's interesting that God doesn't look back at their lack of faith, but he looks at the little faith they still had, right? That's what God remembers. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. So in all these examples so far, all the examples that were being given here, they had faith after salvation in which God made additional promises, promises that were in addition to salvation right? So this is the focus here. It's not talking about faith unto salvation, but is the focus here is on our walk of faith after salvation. What are we doing with what God has given us? Are we living our life, our new life, holy unto him in the new covenant? Um, verse 13 through 16. These all died, I'm sorry, we already read 13, let's go through 14. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country, and truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country that is in heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Amen. As we continue here, we'll, we'll just keep, we'll, we'll continue on, because some of these examples, um, I mean, you, you get the point. 
By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. From whence also he received him in a figure. By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith Jacob, when he was dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning upon the top of his staff. By faith Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith, Moses, when he was come to the years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Through faith, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith, they passed through the Red Sea, as by dry land, which the Egyptians, the same to do, were drowned. By faith. And so we continue on here. We, we get the point. Let's, let's keep moving on down to... I mean, God is able to do many miraculous things when we have faith. Amen? And I want to go down to verse um, 39, where we get to the summary here. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. So you see, they, it's interesting because, well, didn't Abraham and Sarah, they received Isaac, right? It says they received not the promise. There's a singular there, the promise. Well, what's he talking about? What's so special about this particular promise that he's referring to? Again, in the context, the promise is referring to the promise that we've been given, the new covenant. They did not receive the new covenant that we have received, right? And also, you know, we, we still hope and wait. We still have faith for that new city, for the new Jerusalem, for when Christ will come and rule and reign, and when this earth and all of the elements will be melted away, and when he will have a kingdom here, so we also wait for the same promise of that eternity to be with him. They had not yet received the promise. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect, should not be made complete. Okay, So we have some better promise than all of these promises that they were given. This, this new covenant is better than all of the promises that they were given. It's a superior, a better covenant than the old covenant. It's a superior, better covenant than any of these these promises, the, the promise that was given to Abraham, the, the promises that were given to Isaac and Jacob, we have something better than what they had. So looking back at them, they did not have as great of an opportunity as we do. Now moving on to verse 1. Seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. So all of these people who suffered and died and faced persecution for less promises than we have are watching us. 
are looking down on us, are witnessing our every action. We have a better promise available. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, because they're watching, because all of them are watching us, right? Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down the right hand of the throne of God. The word there for author is archagos. It means captain or prince, chief leader. He is our captain. Looking unto Jesus, the, the captain and finisher. The word there, finisher, is pale, paleotes. It means completer or perfecter. So he's the one that has perfected our faith. He is our captain. So looking unto Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him, joy being what? What was that joy? What was the joy that was set before him? Can anyone tell me? I'm sorry? Who was, he, who was he thinking about? What was he thinking about when he went through all of that on the cross? What was his joy? To please the Father. Not to please the Father, but there was something even... What was on his mind when he went to the cross was each and every one of you. Yeah. Each and every one of us. He was that he you were the joy. You were the joy. You and I were the joy that was set before him. That was why he endured the cross. Despising the shame. Amen. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Here's something it says in verse 4. Ye have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Now, none of you have bled for Christ. None of you have, uh, have died for, for Christ, yet he died for you. you. So striving against sin, you've not bled like Jesus Christ died on the cross. So what's the problem here? And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. So we know that if God is chastising you, if, if he is speaking to your heart, then we know that you're a son, that you're a son or a daughter of the Lord, and that because he's not going to chastise, he's not going to convict about these things, uh, uh, about our walk of faith after salvation, if you're not saved to begin with. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us and, gave, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peace.
peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. Who's, whose hands are we to lift up? Whose? Yeah, the main focus here is each other. Obviously, it's, it's a little difficult to, to lift up yourself, right? That's why, you know, he's put us within an, uh, a church, within a body of believers, to be a help unto each other, to encourage each other. It says, and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet. And then the word there, your, it's plural, your, as in not just you individually, but plural. Make a straight path for all. For your feet together, be, you res were responsible for each other, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way. Well, that's a really funny thing to say if he's just talking about one person. If he's just saying you are responsible for yourself, it's really kind of funny to say make a straight path so that maybe one of your feet are lame and it goes out of the way. That doesn't make sense. Obviously, he's talking about we have a responsibility one to another. Amen? Amen. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking, now here's where it really, it really comes together, is verse 15. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled, defiled or poisoned due to this, this bitterness. So if the Hebrews look out for someone who may want to go back to the old covenant, and they're thinking that this is just not worth all the effort and all of the mundaneness and, and everything that goes with the new covenant. Look out for anyone who thinks that, you know, this is, that they want to go back to the world, they want to go back to these things because they could end up defiling many of you. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright, for you know how that afterward when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. So let me ask you a question and something to think about. You don't have to answer, but we're going to look at this. Was Esau lost or was he saved? Was Esau lost or was he saved? I want you to think about that. And we're, going to, we're going to go through a couple of passages here to, to take a look at, at this. Let's start with Romans chapter 9, 13. This is a reference to the Old Testament, actually. Romans chapter 9, verse 13. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. The word there for hated, it's the word uh, meseo. This this word in the English, you know, we usually use this word to mean that you, when you hate someone, it's like you despise, you, um, you are, have it out against them. I mean, you really would like to see their misery and demise, okay? But in the Greek, that's not quite what it means. This word can mean to love less. In the Greek, the word here means to love less. Let me give you an example of where this, this word is used. Let's go to Luke chapter 14, verse 26. Luke chapter 14, verse 26. Now keep in mind that the Bible says that God so loved the world. Well, Esau is part of the world, so how is it that God would hate, despise one Esau's demise if he also loved Esau? So we have to understand that, I'm sorry? Yeah. 
So uh, what I'm saying here is that the, the, the context is that, you know, when we look in the Greek, it, it means to love less. So relative to Jacob, he still loves Esau, but he loves less, okay? And we'll see this in, in Luke chapter 14, verse 26. This is a verse that oftentimes confuses Christians. Let's go ahead and, and read this. Jesus speaking to the multitude, he says, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he could not be my disciple. But doesn't God say you should love your brother? Well, that's strange. He just said he should hate your brother. Well, it's the same word here. What we're talking about, what Jesus is saying here is not that you have it out against your brother and your wife and yourself. Not that you go to war with these. No, that's not what he's saying. He's saying relationship, relationally, compared to Jesus, all of these things should be below. You should love these things less than Jesus. You should love Jesus more than your brother, your sister, your wife, your parents, your, yourself. Jesus should be number one. That's what he is saying. If you want to be his disciple, you need to put him first in your life, first in your priorities. So in Romans, when it says that, it's not necessarily saying that he hated Esau, but it's saying that he loved Jacob more. Okay? And let's go ahead and take a look back. Let's start with, uh, we'll look at the situation with Esau and Jacob. Going back to Genesis 25, starting at 29. Twenty-five through twenty-nine. So we see here, and when, sorry, and the first came out red all over like an hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. And after that came his brother out, and his hand took hold of on Esau's heel, and his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was three score years old when she bore them, and the boys grew, and Esau was a cunning hunter. A man of the field. Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of the venison. But Rebekah loved Jacob. And Jacob sawed pottage. And Esau came from the field. And he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, Because I am at the point to die, and what profit shall this birthright do me? And Jacob said, Swear to me this day. And he sware unto him, and he sold his birthright unto Jacob. When Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. I have uh, two, my, my older brothers are twins, just like these two. Okay? They're, they're identical twins, though, so they look the same. And they always fight over who came out first. Well, I'm eight minutes older than you, so I'm the elder. You have to respect me because I'm eight minutes older than you. Okay? And so this was always disputed, you know, one, one liked to think that he's the one that came out first and they got him mixed up, you know, after in the hospital beds, right? So, uh, the, the, this was the sense of, you know, you, you give me that claim to being the first one that came out, okay, is what he's saying here. And Esau's like, well, okay, what good is that going to do me? You can claim it if you want, okay? Well, it turns out God saw that, and God did not find it as entertaining. In Genesis chapter 27, we see that, that God turned the situation for, in the favor of uh, Jacob here. That not only did he claim that, that birthright, 
that first one to come out from Esau, but then he also claimed the inheritance that would belong to that birthright. In chapter 27, it says, And it came to pass that when Isaac was old and his eyes were dim, so that he could not see, he called Esau his eldest son, and said unto him, My son. And he said unto him, Behold, here am I. And he said, Behold now, I am old. I know not the day of my death. Now therefore take, I pray thee, thy weapons, thy quiver, and thy bow. Go out to the field, and take me some venison, and make me some savory meat, such as I love, and bring it to me, that I may eat, my soul may be blessed. Bef uh, my soul may bless thee before I die. And, and as we see here, if we go through, I'm, I'm not going to read the whole chapter because we're kind of short on time, but what happens is, is that uh, Jacob and Rebecca, Re Rebecca puts, uh, has Jacob go out and get some lambs from the field, and she prepares some meat very quickly for, for Isaac, for Jacob to bring in to Isaac, puts some fur on his skins and on his neck, and, and then Isaac says, well, you sound like, you sound like Jacob. Are you sure you're Esau? And he says, you, you, let me feel you, and, and he feels him. It's hairy, just like Esau. So then uh, what happens is, is that Isaac gives a blessing to Jacob. He eats the meat. And then in comes Esau out from the field. He's prepared his meat, and he brings it to his father. But the father says, Isaac says to him, I've already given the blessing. I've already given the blessing. The, the, all of the blessing that belonged to you, it's already been to, J to Jacob, and so it shall be. And uh, Esau became very upset, very angry. In fact, it says he wanted to kill Jacob. After he mourned his father, he was going to kill Jacob. He had intent in his heart to do so. And so Rebekah sends Jacob away to uh, Laban, to the relative Laban. Okay? And then uh, many years later, we come to Genesis chapter 33. Let's go there. Genesis chapter 33. And Jacob, so this is Jacob coming back home from, from the situation. You know, he's been at Laban. He uh, married two of Laban's daughters. And now he's got lots of children, and they're coming back. And Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, Esau came, and with him four hundred men. And he divided the children unto Leah and unto Rachel, his two wives, and unto the two handmaids. And he put the handmaids and their children foremost, and Leah and her children after, and Rachel and Joseph hindermost. And he passed before, over before them and bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. And Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him. So instead of coming after him to kill him, we see here a man who loved his brother and missed his brother. And they wept. And he lifted up his eyes and saw the women and the children and said, Who are those with thee? And he said, The children with God, uh, which God has graciously given thy servant. And then the handmaidens came near, and they and their children, and they bowed themselves. And Leah also with her children came near and bowed themselves. And, and okay, so we see, you know, that Esau no longer has it out against Jacob. Amen? Esau has gotten over this matter. He's apparently he must have gotten right with the Lord. Uh, about this situation. And we also see, let's go on to Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 1 through 7. So I, I just want, before we go back to Hebrews, I just want you to really see how, what, what was Esau, what was this all about? What was the entire scope of the situation? Was he a, a saved man or a lost man? We see here in Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 1 through 7, 
This is God speaking to Moses. This is God Almighty speaking to Moses. It says, Then we turned and took our journey into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea, as the Lord spake unto me. And we compassed Mount Seir many days. And the Lord spake unto me, saying, Ye have compassed this mountain long enough. Turn you northward, and command thou the people, saying, Ye are to pass through the coast of your brethren, the children of Esau, which dwell in Seir, and they shall be afraid of you. Take ye good heed unto yourselves. Meddle not with them, for I will not give you of their land not so much as a foot breadth, because I have given Mount Seir unto Esau for possession. Ye shall buy meat of them for money that ye may eat, and ye shall buy also buy water of them for money that ye may drink. For the Lord thy God hath blessed thee in all thy works of thy hand. He knoweth thy walking through this great wilderness these forty years. The Lord thy God hath been with thee. Thou hast lacked nothing. So we see here, God says, I promised this land to Esau. This land belongs to Esau, and you're not going to take one foot of it, okay? To, to the Israelites, to Moses. Well, why would God have promised something to a lost man? I, I would think that God would only make promises like that to someone who is a believer, someone who is saved. So I, that leads me to believe that Esau was a saved man. Yet, he missed out on being part of the lineage of Jesus Christ. He missed out on the birthright that he would have had. And the message for us here, we have this opportunity in the new covenant. And even though you're saved, you could miss out on all of the promises that are given to the new covenant. You could miss out on those if you leave out, if you, if you disregard it just the same way that Esau disregarded his birthright. So we need, to, we need to understand the seriousness of God's promises, the seriousness of the New Testament, and why it's important that we meet together. And, uh, you know, I would love to continue. We'll, we'll do this next time. We'll continue on to, to the two mounts, Mount Sinai and Mount Sion. We'll talk about that the rest of the chapter, but we're going to save that for next time because uh, we're getting low on time. So let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer. Brother Wilson, would you please close in a word of prayer?